well. So hello, everybody. Hello, relatives. My name is Sadie Redwing. I, uh, I work at the American College and I'm a student, student success coach. And I thought I would take the time here to share a little bit of my journey and um, how I've been able to weave some advocacy work within design research and higher education and kind of seeing how there's a lot of overlap in some of the stuff that I speak for, but then also to get an understanding of um, either one, what does uh, indigeneity look like in the United States, or what does uh, indigenous graphic design look like here in the United States, or just even to just where, where are some conversations we're having as ind indigenous demographics. So I am a citizen of the Spirit Lake Dakota tribe. So um, that's where I'm enrolled. Uh, I have, and I'll show, I'll show where that's at in a second, but I have on this image here, this map, um, because as I get into this work that I'm going to share here, land is going to be important in this idea of how regions in the United States are different based on the terrain and then also to what resources come from the land. So thinking about like crops and animals, what the weather's like, um, you know, materials, seeds, um, shell, you name it, it's, it's, it's all going to be um, a part of when it comes to uh, establishing visual representation and identity based on land. Um, so of being the Lakota and Dakota, those are two grass, uh, grasslands prairie tribes here in the um, here in the middle of the United States, but I kind of disagree with this uh, map a little bit. I've always grew up hearing stories that um, us in the Great Plains tribes, we would follow the buffalo from Canada all the way down to the Carolinas. Um, but once contact came and farming was introduced and more seeds from different uh, trees and, and other crops and whatnot, um, our prairie uh, got destroyed. I mean, there's still some great grasslands area, uh, grassland areas um, in the uh, area. My slide's taken a second to advance. Um, but just to kind of show, um, kind of the territory that I will be representing here as a speaker. So that little tiny red dot in North Dakota is where the Spirit Lake Reservation is in the Fort Totten Devils Lake area. Um, my citizenship is there, but I was born and raised and I claim Central South Dakota or the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation um, as home. Um, I uh, Fort Pier holds the Bad River, the Wakpasicha, and that's where my family is from. That's where I grew up. And um, I, our, the Missouri River that splits South Dakota in half is really influential in my life. Um, so a lot of people I notice they don't, they haven't came to, they never been to South Dakota. And and I get it. I mean, we have, there's there's not a whole lot, but we do get a lot of visitors who will visit the Black Hills, who come see the Badlands, um, Mount Rushmore. Uh, the Sturgis Rally, um, kind of more that Western uh, Black Hills area is always very popular, but a lot of folks don't really, um, pre-COVID, haven't really had a chance to explore the prairie. So if you're just driving through I-90 and going across the state, you're not going to experience much of the beauty of the prairie. And it's a little bit of a design choice to put, let's say, the railroad, which advances into the interstate, and it's so far away from the reservations. Like you have to get off and go on, go into a more rural area to get into some of the reservations within the Dakotas. But if you ever get a chance to, it's beautiful. You know, we have beautiful flowers and animals and, um, you know, it may be different than the beauty of the beach and the coast. And it may be different than the beauty of the Rockies, but the prairie holds, holds its own. And I wish more people could have seen what it looked like before farming um, came into play. So currently I work with American Indian College Fund. I'm a student success coach. So I'm not technically like a graphic designer that sits behind the screen and is, you know, developing logos and websites. I actually um, really admire the College Fund's work. They're one of the largest Native American organizations in the United States held in Denver, Colorado. So that's where I live now. And we, one of the reasons why I joined um, or wanted to be part of the American College Fund is they really are influential in networking and providing resources to tribal colleges, to mainstream colleges that don't that are lacking resources for Native American students, as well as um, learning how to 
build structures from the ground up. So if I'm in a position where I want to open up my own design school in the future that is native indigenous focused, um, I need to know how to do it. I need to do it, but how, how do I get the money to do it? You know, how, how do I build it? What's that gonna look like curriculum? So um, I'm very fortunate to be in this position to um, one, provide and help and advocate for Native American students, especially during COVID time when, co uh, when all these rural areas are not getting what they need, but in, as well as providing an example of what higher education spaces look like when um, the perspective is, is showing indigenous culture. Um, so I was mentioning earlier, some of these, I, I didn't realize that it's been a good four years since I, um, since I left graduate school and I did a lot of public speaking. I um, participated in an ambassador's program as a graduate student of the College Fund as the images on top. At the bottom, um, I uh, spent a lot of time traveling. I was able to travel internationally and um, shared a presentation called F the Stereotype and um, kind of and during that time, which I'll kind of talk a little bit later on, um, what it means to be a designer and activist. Um, and having, being somebody who is talking on those subjects, you're kind of, you're brought into these conversations and during the time in, um, I would say about 2015, 14, 15, 16, everything, majority of the conversations were diversity, inclusion, and equity. And when you're in those conversations, um, I would have to be in a, in a position to say, I want Native Americans to be more inclusive in these spaces, but once we become more inclusive of these spaces, we gotta be aware of how to facilitate conversations around um, sensitivities in design. Sensitivities, for example, being cultural appropriation. You know, that's always an uncomfortable subject. And sometimes a lot of facilitators or educators don't know how to uh, facilitate a conversation like that when whoever they're having a the conversation with may be sensitive or vulnerable to the subject. Um, and just providing, you know, example of how to have a conversation. So for example, if we're talking about cultural appropriation, how is the term appropriation being defined? How is that different than adapting? And how is that different than infusion or fusing, you know, two things together? Um, another thing, another popular topic that's come about is uh, colonization, decolonization. And, you know, when we're talking about the colonization of place, um, you know, why is there not more talk about sovereignty? Or I'm starting to bring this other term into the design uh, space is uh, repatriation. You hear that word more in the field of museum studies um, of uh, wanting to obtain some of our stolen belongings from institutes and museums, but also too, it's just about reclaiming and providing accurate history of how something was invented or came about and taking uh, whatever has been taken away and bringing it back to be more of a functional <laughs> purpose, you could say. So I've been very fortunate. And in, in these times where I've spoken in a classroom or spoken at a workshop or um, just, you know, but just been in conversations with the panels, the I always introduce or always share how powerful we are as designers. I really had to iterate it, especially to students who never consider themselves as a designer. They may have considered themselves as an artist or even as a crafter when it comes to making, um, I guess, Native American or cultural objects or um, I guess any type of something that you can make. But I always start off by saying, you know how powerful we are as designers. We, we have the power to show somebody their language and we have the power to show somebody their identity. Now that's scary. Like when you really think about it, we are the ones that allow somebody to see what their language looks like. People can speak it, but as a designer, the designer is the one that actually brings it to life in a different form, the, vis the visual form. Um, and I also too, I like to classify language as not just verbal, visual, but also body language. Um, and uh, I guess so that's a whole different conversation of the different types of languages. But just to know that us in the position of a designer and providing visual representation, we are the ones that provide that language and also the identity. Like we are the ones that show somebody who they are and that's crazy. And what's even more insane is that there's a lot of people who have this power and they abuse it and they abuse it um, 
in a way that they don't, they may not know they may be harming an identity or language. Um, so that's why we need to get more educated um, individuals who have the power to accurately, appropriately, and demonstrate what, what respectful design is when it comes to uh, designing for either somebody's unique language or identity. And thinking about designing for language and identity, imagine having to do that with 570 plus different languages and identities. Now, I always have to reference that there are still tribes existed today. You know, it's such a hard pill to swallow when um, to this day in 2020 across the globe, there's people who don't think indigenous people exist. Um, I have a classroom, I have a class, well, previously I've had a classroom of students where um, people just had no idea they existed. And that's, to me, that's insane, but it's reality. Um, so as, uh, as we get into talking about uh, federally recognized tribes, and we we're talking about how to present that sovereignty amongst the United States. We have to visually show that and demonstrate that, um, as well as making sure that. Um, okay, let me let me explain it this way. In Native American, in some Indigenous values, uh, how do you want to say they push for, for reciprocity, the give back, a cycle, a function, a balance. Um, so in thinking about a student's journey, so if a Native American student wanted to get into design and at the end of the day, it's ingrained in them that um, they, it's their choice, that they want to go back to their sovereign nation and they want to be a graphic designer, well, you might be designing for an entire nation. And that's a huge responsibility. And it's a responsibility that they cannot relate to in means of a traditional mainstream American student, because not every American student is looking to go work at the White House and design for the entire United States and for an entire nation. Um, ideally, they're either focused in a specific area of interest or wanting to update their portfolio so they can get hired at a company or organization or firm. Um, they don't have that same stress of having to represent an entire nation. So sometimes those will disconnect when it, me when it means of um, what are the goals for a Native American graphic designer. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start sharing some of my frustrations here. And some of these frustrations are going to be in screen caps. But this is kind of giving an idea of how this fire in me started and wanting to bring um, this frustration into a design graduate school. And what can I create that's going to help? Um, I, I mean, the frustration is still there. It's not completely getting rid of it. But what, what can I do to um, to do something to get away from this pan-Indianism. So I always, when we get into this topic of who has access to what resources and who has access to, um, I guess, libraries of what uh, cultural identity is. And it's hard because Native Americans, we don't have that. We don't have, um, like we don't have our own search engines, we don't have our own Google, and we don't have, we're, we're now in the means of acquiring um, to build these resource banks. So these upcoming generations, they're not gonna be struggling to find um, appropriate and authentic imagery to uh, inspire or to learn from. Because currently, and I'll show here in a, in a couple more slides, our resource banks and our and how we're researching some of this stuff in our um, in our everyday you know lives. You can on Google. We're so you know we're so reliable reliable on Google right now. Um, but sometimes some of those some of the stuff doesn't really help us as much. So looking at so if you were to Google Native American graphic design, um, you're gonna show not, <laughs> you're going to, you're going to see more stereotypical imagery versus actual Native American graphic designers. Why is that? Um, that's a whole other conversation within technology. If you recently seen a social dilemma and, and understand how your experience is curated. So my search results are going to be different than your search results. But at the end of the day, what I would hope to be in our Native American graphic design search results are still not there. So I always have students share, well, where do you get your inspiration from? Where do you, uh, where do you go to search uh, for 
to see other artists, other design work. So popular uh, platform is Behance. And, uh, and two, I just screen capped these yesterday at my lunch break. So like these are just from <laughs> like less than tw 24 hours ago. Um, you know, what inspiration are they getting when looking at, let's say, Behance artists? And I, again, have them do two things. One is what, uh, what, what result comes first? Like how are they prioritized? Who, who, um, whose search results are on page one versus like page eight? And then also too, where are these resources coming from? So you can gander the idea, like there's a little mix, mix match here when it comes to what's appropriate and what's stereotypical. But what, what I usually like to do is I like to have students see where, where this work com comes from. And so let me given it a scenario to provide an understanding of why a lot of these images don't work. So let's say, um, let's say it's August, August going to September, that's the time where our choke cherries in the prairie blossom. Let's say we're gonna, and I don't, I don't know why Pierre, South Dakota doesn't have a choke cherry festival, but let's say that Pierre, the capital of South Dakota Pierre had a choke cherry festival, uh, which is, you know, a traditional food of the fruit, fruit of the prairie. And I wanted a native designer to uh, to do the event design for it, the the branding, you know, making the publications, you name it. So they need some inspiration. They get on Behance, they type in Native American. This is what they get. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, and again, I'm just just gonna spend a little bit of time on this one. But um, this doesn't help in means of finding inspiration for Native American identity nor language, and Again, the, so the, and even too seeing where this where this com comes from. So the artist is from France, and I don't know, like I don't know what indigenous people from France look like. You know, maybe they do like Carol Baskin, like dancing with the animals and and stuff here, but it doesn't speak to an American native a Native American of the United States. So, um, but then again, I'm curious how did how did someone from France make it to our one. I don't know, I'm just gonna leave it at this one. Why do people internationally like to make stuff that reference Native American culture? And then two, um, why, why, why are they the ones that get, get to the top of the, the Google search results? Um, this one, we have an artist from Brazil. Uh, Brazilian, you know, they wear headdresses in, um, gosh, head, headdress is a whole, whole nother, you know, a whole nother course, but, um, down in South America, they do wear headdresses, but this headdress reflects a Great Plains headdress in, the, in North America, not South America. And I'm not for sure if anybody knows of um, uh, the, the movement right now against the murdered and missing indigenous women. I wouldn't find this extremely appropriate, but again, not very helpful in the means of, um, in means of an, let's say a native student wanting to do some research. Another one, we got one from Spain. Um, now this this piece is titled Sue Warrior, and I'm assuming I mean again we don't this it, assuming this is a female with a with a dress uh, depicts a um, woman of brown skin and brown hair. And I, sorry I didn't get a chance to scroll, but as you scroll down, you her dress isn't of um, she has a dress that reflects the Southwest and not necessarily the Great Plains. So it'd be nice if this is titled Sioux Warrior that she would actually wear something that reflects Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, AKA Sioux, and it doesn't. So again, you're you're not. And, and too, like, I don't know what it is about putting women or, you know, females in headdresses. There's a, a, a character made from artists of France. Um, usually, Again, the headdress is more is a um, a sign of honor worn by mostly males, especially those who have gone into battle. So again, I don't, um, I just, I don't, I'm not for sure what what they're trying to portray when you're putting a a character into um, specific adornment. And again, at the end of the day, like I'm not, I I just don't understand how. Let's just say, like I wouldn't be in a position to say I make character, I do character designs. Like I would. I, I, or for the fun of it, let's just say like, I like drawing, I like drawing people. Like I would probably draw my relatives before I would draw uh, or before I would like um, really make a portfolio of cultures I didn't understand, if that makes sense, but I'm not gonna dwell too much on it. Another thing that we kind of get out of um, uh, seeing individuals in endowment is what's, uh, 
this fabricated notion of what our religion is. And, or, and I don't like that um, a lot of our uh, religious tropes, so let's say like the peace pipe, it always gets um, stereotyped into this idea of drugs and psychedelics. And I just like, I'm, I'm not into that. I, I just, I just feel that's really disrespectful, especially, you know, we live in an age where there is a large, you know, drug pandemic and um, to tie, you know, these tropes of the, the smoking culture with, with a lot of these um, respected traditional, uh, I guess, imagery, it just, it's just, it's just a little disheartening, kind of, kind of bums me out in a way, but again, there's a gentleman with the headdress, you know, not that doesn't look like uh, uh and a great plain headdress. I'm not for sure what of what tribal descent this gentleman is, but it's still, I mean, like I could see this in a poster, or I could see like this poster exploited. Um, let's say like Spencer's or Hot Topic or on um on clothing and whatnot. I thought this one was a little cool from India. Um, that's another conversation that's always interesting to have, uh, the American Indian versus the Indian American, but you know, just the a Native American gentleman that has a little bit of more exaggerated features. And this is this one's out of Ukraine. And um, again, this one blows my mind. Let's say that I have a student, again, doing research, wants to learn more about Great Plains. They come across this gentleman who's in Great Plains adornment, but then he has coastal, uh, like Northwest, Northeast, um, kind of like uh, the tribes that occupy the coast along the uh, Canada and uh, United States border, you know, they have more woodworking. Um, I, I always feel bad when I see like totem poles, uh, stereotypes, but again, I don't know what this artist is trying to say. It could be um, if, if somebody was vulnerable and they're just looking for adornment pieces, they may accidentally use the wrong tribe's stuff or, or I shouldn't say just stuff, but the wrong tribe's designs, artifacts, clothing pieces. And if that gets documented as a, as a, as a resource, again, it's devastating and it's inaccurate and it happens all the time. So getting, needing to know where um, the, uh, needing to know the distinction between these tribes is super important. So what I just showed also too was, was individuals or people like to represent a culture based on an individual. It just means that you there's such a lack of understanding of the actual visual language of our pattern, how we how we write and, and, and uh, record and document. Um, I can go into these couple of frustrations as bringing with me to NC State. You know, this this Father's Day card, like I don't like it. Like Daddy, the Native American man, you got the teepees, the headdresses. Like, what is that? <laughs> and and two, I want to, and I never thought this would be so weird, but. Um, I, this is my first time showing a slide of the Washington R Words football logo, and they actually um, retired the logo. So, to know um, like the movement and changes coming, like that demonstrates it. But I have this on here because again, it's an individual with the stereotypical tropes of the feathers. You have no idea what what tribe this guy's from. Um, and this one grinds my gears the most. And, um, and this will be my last frustrating stereotype example. But the reason why is because there's a lack of, there's a lot of misinterpretation of communication in this piece. One, you got a gentleman sitting bull who's from North Dakota, South Dakota, somebody who comes from uh, you know, my tribal territory, but he's matched with the Arizona flag. This, this gentleman sitting bull, chief sitting bull, he's not from Arizona. This is a missed opportunity to, to give um, acknowledgement to a Arizona tribe to a tribe within the Arizona territory um, representation and also educate people whose chief or whose um, leaders native leaders come from Arizona but just the missed opportunity of um, this was an actual uh, event publication to represent indigenous people say I don't I'm not gonna say where at in, in Arizona because I don't know um, but again this is a problem and it's a problem for the indigenous race is be, it's because stuff like this rewrites our history. So people again are continuously to not know, the more you don't know, the more it's gonna get lost. So we're really trying to avoid that, especially for us who are trying to, who are um, wanting to function as a sovereign nation. So, so now you gotta see my frustrations and how you know it's tough to live in a world where you're surrounded by stereotypes or uh, inappropriate 
imagery of who you're supposed to be. But in order to understand my work, and I showed you a little bit of what South Dakota is, and kind of see what um, what our own visual language looks like. It's not so much decoration. It's not so much done to look cool. It's just a matter of how we use land resources to document um, and record specific things. Now, I um, am in no position to explain um, some of these designs, especially if they depict family histories. I'm not gonna blast someone's family history here on Zoom. It'd be the same as like, I would have no business talking about a tartan, um, uh, say Irish or Scottish plaid pattern. Like I wouldn't be trying to uh, share what that family meant by picking specific line colors or line weights in that pattern. Like that's um, their, their own too. Uh, to share when it comes to how they, they, they design that visual language. Well, here, I just kind of want to give an idea of um, how these resources brought up what our visual language looks like. You see, again, just a lot of um, simple shapes. You got a lot of diamonds, triangles. Some of these kind of look a little bit like pitchforks almost. You Sometimes you see some of those imageries in, uh, within the Middle East. So there's a lot of sharedness amongst there. Um, as we, you know, another, uh, this would kind of be a representation of um, if we were to have a traditional design on a on a on a Lakota flag. This might represent our our um, our values as uh, us who protect the prairie. So, kind of giving another example of the prairie. This might be more in the western southwestern area of the Dakotas. But I wanted to also share how this grass, how these grass blades, and also to the porcupine quill. Of the porcupines that live within the prairie, and how we use that porcupine quill to uh, to um, one make adornment, make protection, but also make designs. And I get into this uh, in my thesis. I talk about a lot of these designs are so simple, is because what was used to make them are simple. Like we're not, you know, back during this time, we didn't have pen pen and paper. Um, you know, we had uh, beautiful artists that would that would. Uh, pluck quills, they'll flatten them, they'll dye them. Now we may not have as saturated colors as this example of cool work back then, but we did have some beautiful flowers that gave us some dyes. So um, uh, aside of the porcupine quill, our leather work, uh, parfletch work, a um, lot of, again, very simple designs, but a good way to track who's materials may be in that luggage or what is in that luggage in the means of, um, again, if you don't have uh, like the, the, the written alphabet, how are you gonna distinct or remember or record or document what, um, what that device may be used for? On the right here, another example of quill work. And I don't wanna spend too much time, but I want to kind of just give greater examples of some of the ways that we documented history and work and that's been preserved for hundreds of years. Um, I have, um, as I mentioned, the I, uh, I'm enrolled in a Dakota tribe and the Dakotas are uh, more of a more Eastern on um, within the Dakotas and uh, within the Minnesota area, but they have a history of being displaced as well. And they share a lot of Anishinaabe uh, floral designs. And what is beautiful is to see um, more of the woodlands floral, um, if you ever get a chance or just really enjoy, um, I, you know, flowers or botany designs, I would I would suggest checking out some of those woodland floral designs. So yeah, so sometimes in my work, I'll, I'll put some floral des designs and to depict that I have Dakota blood in me as well. Um, within this high too, we have a strong history of ledger art or documenting specific wars. Um, I don't if there's any history buffs or interested in like Battle of Little Bighorn or other ledger pieces. Um, it's a great way we documented wars and um, one one of one thing that um, I've been in positions to admit that a lot of history in the United States was written inaccurately. And the reason why we know it's written inaccurately is because we have things like the winter counts or these ledgers or these little uh, icons that speak to a whole year and how, um, and this is a responsibility to, to know what each icon mean and what happened during this time and to know that we still have these, you know, hundreds and thousands of years later and um or well let's just i just say like i'm i respect the folks that are respect the families that are caretakers of the ledgers but it's unfortunate that a lot of this stuff was sent to the museums um and i know there's a lot of museums i want to kind of revitalize some of these winter count collections uh, i pulled this from the Smithsonian, as you can tell this is way outdated but it's again we 
people sometimes like to stereotype us as being primitive and we didn't have a language or we didn't know how to write or, um, you know, we, we just did things a little bit different because the, um, or, you know, we had so many different, so many different languages and we didn't talk as much as this, this concept, this culture of talking is a little bit different than it used to be before contact. Um, I want to give reference to this because this book has been uh, my, my huge inspiration for my NC State research, which I'm going to get to here now. And the reason why I like this book, again, it's not the most accurate, but there, there is some truth in here. And there's some truth and there is um, some good examples of traditional designs, especially for, for beginners. And the reason why I say I like this for the truth is because Carrie Lifford, she makes a comment in there. She said, you know, she said, when it comes to a lot of uh, Western Sioux or Lakota um, uh, visual languages or designs or patterns, um, they, they can be interpreted differently amongst families, amongst everybody. And the reason for that is because you only have a couple simple shapes. You only got like 13 shapes. Of course, you're going to reuse the shape in, in different ways. She said, what's unfortunate is that there was a researcher who is non-Indigenous and he wanted to learn what some of these designs are. So he only spoke to one uh, Western Sioux um, uh, designer, I'll say. I'm going to start saying, saying designer. And what he documented on that designer's interpretation is what got put into a resource or a book. And that's what got published. So then when that published book got put onto the library, then that's what people have to see they're saying oh this this symbol means this um uh at, across the board and that's not the case so you will only get one family's interpretation or one individual's interpretation to define these shapes um but that's that's okay i mean it's it's a it's a starting point and now we're in 2020 and we're digressing from what it was in the early 1900s but uh, but it was just nice to hear that, that authenticity from an author. And it also too, she explained some of these conventions of um, how you might see some of these designs interpreted. You see a lot of combination, um, you know, there'll be a lot of, if you're documenting specific, let's say we're talking about someone who owned a certain amount of horses or owned a certain amount of whatever, you know, it could have been interpreted within these symbols. And I have this, this um, this this dotted line here to explain reflection and uh one of the reasons why there's so much reflection and symmetry is this idea in this of um the world that we're living in now the world that we're walking in now is completely equal to the spiritual world or any other worlds that we'll um we'll get to experience in our soul's eternity but again it's a good uh, it's a good way to demonstrate uh, balance. Uh, everybody's equal. Uh, we're all related. It's, it's just a, it's just the way of, of, of living. And um, so kind of, again, understanding the symbols and conventions of uh, the visual language and what this, I'm, I created this piece at North Carolina State and I got to a point in my, in my studies is I want to be, I want to help students, um, being able to create designs like this and not rely on teepees, headdresses, and uh, and buffaloes, like. But a student may be hesitant to design something like this because this might look, even though it is simple shapes and there's simple conventions, there's it's still a little bit complex. So how can I get a student who has never seen, let's say, a beadwork design, and then have them able be able to create something like this to be able to revitalize our traditional visual language. So here's what I get into graduate studies. And I'm just gonna go by this quick because I guarantee, you know, either you've seen this before, you're doing stuff similar, but get into this, this user experience of, well, how do I get some somebody who's never seen a specific language to, um, to get them to practice and get them more courageous to want to ask questions and learn and, and to not be so scared of, um, of using traditional designs, um, especially designs that come with a lot of protocoling and a lot of respect to families. Um, but what you just saw was, um, again, kind of bringing this idea of the porcupine. And if I were to uh, 
give somebody an uh, example of shapes and just give them a line, which would be the toothpick here. What, how would these influence the creation within those toothpicks? Let me get some, some that are a little bit more, um, I would call this a little bit more abstract, even though it may look like a church or a boat. Um, and I would, I was actually really surprised that um, in this case study, somebody just by seeing the shapes created something that reflected some of our leather work parfletch design. So kind of taking away the toothpick and providing uh, the actual shape, you know, again, what can they can construct? And this is kind of that research before you bring it into a digital device and just kind of just seeing, seeing somebody's mannerisms and somebody's um, choices and how they select something, how they, how they build something, how they put something together when it's just a simple shape. Not so much focus on a definition right now, but it's just more on bringing these shapes into play and get something that's a little bit more abstract and get something that kind of speaks to a little bit more reflection, combination, um, something that might be seen that uh, may not represent a specific tribe, but it, it, it speaks to it in a way that um, that can help somebody practice. So, so kind of, so knowing that there is some motivation that just by seeing shapes, it would influence somebody to do something, even if it was just putting two triangles together, that's something. And the next thing, and um, just don't have enough time to kind of go over this actual structure, but to how do I bring that same motivations to light? How do I, how do I make a, a tool that has shapes that they're going to connect together and in the center there where it's just, um, kind of like a skeleton format, just need an idea on, okay, if I touch the shape, does it stick together? Does it, does the shape look better if it slides across the screen? Um, kind of like those general movement studies and um, kind of over, uh, as you kind of kind of see a more completed um, aspect, you know, if you have, let's say an iPad, you know, what if you bring something like shake or the movement of a device? And again, I know, um, you know, this is done what, four or five, five years ago, there's just, there's, there's you know, greater, greater things now of um, demonstrating with movement and whatnot. But um, I, but I never seen that before. I never seen uh, an application where I could play around with my own visual language. Never, never seen it. Um, actually, uh, this is still in prototype mode. I don't, I don't have it built yet because my focus kind of turned, but just to provide some example of, um, of how we can use technology to, to revitalize some, some languages that are going extinct. And in that way, uh, designers don't have to use a profile of a Native American face. They can start bringing um, some more um, shapes. And, and I, I apologize for these next couple slides because- Sadie, uh, can we, mm -hmm. I, just so we have enough time for a Q&A, um, mm -hmm. would you be okay if we jumped into having people reach out with some questions? Absolutely. Um, I'll just explain these last two because these last two okay. things look a little bit funky. Okay. Um, the one reason why they look a little bit funky is um, in that book that I shared, it's uh, um, Carrie Liffer, Miss Liffer, she puts a whole catalog of, of traditional designs, but they're only black and white. And what I didn't show in these, in these slides here is that um, in order to replicate those black and white images in, is it, it's kind of like a little like a color by numbers type of thing. A student would be able to see a traditional design brought to life in a form that might be in a or in a form that might have colors that they never seen before related onto this design, as well as um, you know kind of seeing it in a digital way. So it's just a new breath of fresh air of um, bringing some like. And I mean ancient, like I, or not ancient, when I mean like, um, you know, kind of like older, like, like before 1400s, um, just as however long have we been using these designs, it was just nice to see them in the year uh, 2000s and kind of, um, again, just doing a little bit of the shape play, but I'll end it right here for questions because um, now following what um, I was able to develop at NC State um, has led me to platforms to speak, has led me to brought on um, accurate representation, especially during times of um, climate, social, or, uh, sorry, climate change movement, social justice, environmental justice, and just the means of why um, as indigenous, why do indigenous, why does indigenous, 
indigenous demographic need to function as a sovereign nation? How do we represent that? And how do we do that so that we are respected and recognized and represented at a national level and we're just not using stereotypes? So I will end it at there. That was a lot. You got a chance to see a little bit of some of the work, some of the stereotypes or frustrations, but I guarantee there's others that hold similar frustrations, that hold similar challenges designing for an entire specific demographic area, as well as, um, you know, just what it, you may be in a challenge where you're lacking resources. It's, it's um, so I'll stop right there. I want to yeah. open it because I want to hear and, um, and I'll get a grab a drink of water here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you're touching on so many things that I myself am considering and I know many others are as well, just in terms of cultural appropriation, thinking about imagery and what comes to mind through the stereotypes that either media has presented what has been written about incorrectly or um, has then become cemented as part of our understanding of a culture. And so I think like, you know, all of the context that you're beginning to show to kind of build out um, how it's informing your interests and your position in the way that design should be is, is really, really fascinating. And I think something that I had wrote down as you were talking um, one of the things that I think one of the first things that you had mentioned was this idea between artist or artisan, someone who's doing craft, and then someone who's design or considered a designer. And so I, I find those three things to be interesting because I even struggle with what labels I use myself. But I do think that there become these distinctions with, with how people think um, hierarchy could be placed on these different titles. So I'm just curious in your view too, like how you kind of move across them, dispel others, or sort of take on the ones that you feel represent you the best. Absolutely. And actually this is like an ongoing conversation and it's a sensitive conversation too, especially if people don't see these terms in a hier hierarchical, hier in a hierarchy way. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, I'm just kind of explain a little bit of a feeling that I have. Um, but when in my undergraduate, I went to a tribal college. Um, I was immersed in um, immersed in a lot of things that I thought was was like normal. Um, just a means of uh, I thought everything was art. I never knew what this idea of design was because going to a tribal art school, we're talking ourselves as artists. Now, once I transitioned to a mainstream college, um, I got to actually see or understand what design is or how it how it's taught, um, how it's researched. And I'm sitting there thinking like, man, like we do this already. Like, like why? Um, and then started to 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 dissect like why why isn't there no like native american like text in in design when we, we literally communicate in a graphic design way um why uh why is our art always in like um first american primitive or why like why are we still seen as those type of artists and then if we're seen uh in a more contemporary view uh and an example that I'm getting on the Adams family when, um, or even too, if, if this, this idea of craft of like a Native American person selling, um, I don't know, selling little things that they may have created. Um, so we're always in, and then even too, we have laws and rights that are within like the arts and crafts politics. But I, I kind of see it as, man, like we, as natives, like we do design work, but we, we don't call ourselves designers and no one else calls us designers. People expect us to be doing craft. Now, I respect the practice of craft. I respect, you know, the, the folks who uh, may do something, I don't know if you want to say more of a hobby, um, maybe stuff that you might go to Hobby Lobby, gather supplies, make something, or there's, you know, there's other cultures out there, um, um, you know, maybe like those of the Amish uh, who are, how do you wanna say, kind of live in, in, in their own culture a bit and they do a little bit stuff that'd be similar to crafts, but they're not dehumanized as much as, as our craft. But I always kind of thought that design is always like the upper, the upper um, 
class, kind of like more wealthy, where the kind of more professional dominance is. Art is um, you 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 almost fending for yourself in a ways. You know, starving artist. You're 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 using. And I'm explaining this totally. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I'll jump in. I mean, I think the thing that's interesting to me in conversations that I've been a part of too is just like the understanding of of the two. Similarly, like the starving artist is a stereotype, also, right? And like what people perceive to be as a particular way of being. But also, when you think about like you know conversations around who gets to do this design if you are an indigenous student, or in my case, if I was a black student who was interested in sort of engaging with some of these things, like I think sometimes I just was not aware that there is a, dif a difference or a distinction. And so I think that there's, there's really interesting sort of dynamics that come to play um, with just awareness of the language. And I think you would even mention too, just like knowing and, and having a frame of reference around what language means, um, or even just, I think you had said, infusing, adapting, um, cultural appropriation, what are people's definitions of these words? And that all of them actually kind of create like a, a different sort of understanding um, within that. Um, I think one other question I, I have um, is, is that, you know, in thinking about, um, like all of these examples that are showing up in Behance, do you think that where, how do we move past that point? Like where, where do we need to go beyond kind of those types of examples? And what do you think needs to happen in order to kind of have more realistic um, and more authentic sort of examples of, of indigenous design um, in, in the sphere uh, at large? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna have to um, do my best to kind of make sure that everyone's kind of understanding where I'm coming from. Um, so when I sh when I talked about um, you know the power of being a, a graphic designer, that power comes with responsibilities, and that those responsibilities um, depend on um, whatever you're producing. It has to be, or you know, accurate, authentic. You like, you can't just be as a designer. Like, I can't just um, pull something out of my rear and expect it to um, expect it to be to to do something. As an artist, there's so much more freedom. Like, you don't you you're not worried about. It's about your your expression. Um, so the lines get a little bit blurred when we say look at those um, behanced examples and I let's say I ask somebody like you know why in your free time when you want to create art um, you're drawing a depiction of somebody's identity or just a means of like um, actual ties to a race <laughs> that st mm -hmm. still ex exists and you know their comment like well I like it you know I think it's cool I um I know I love the culture I think it's beautiful I like to write and I get it like I um you know I admire other cultures from afar but I don't actively um produce stuff to be shared largely and also um if I am going to do something similar, I'm going to give some reference of where I'm getting this information from. Um, I don't see that in, uh, in a lot. So I, um, and I may begin a little bit off topic on the question to ask, but what I, the reason why I kind of have students ponder that is a means of like, let's say you have a Behance profile, you're showing a portfolio samples of work. There's other students that really, let's say there's a, a fan of your, of the work that you, you're putting out on a platform um, and they are inspired by it. Um, they want to use it. And then the way they use it is completely a 180 than how you, um, intended it to be and um yeah I mean I think like that I think that's the challenging part I think about um like appropriation and and finding the line I think you know for me I'm I'm definitely a person who appropriates from a lot of spaces but often in a way to kind of navigate um 
these histories that have been written in a particular way or told in a particular way. So I think that there's, you know, I think you even mentioned too the responsibility, not only a responsibility as a designer to be making something that's interesting and cool, but also to think about where am I getting this reference? How am I actually putting it back into the world? And what's the impact of me doing so um, for the community that is either being represented by these images or not? Um, I think the the other question I'll have, like one more kind of last question though, someone put into the chat here um, from Bex that said, thank you so much for sharing your work and your thoughts. Um, I think there, is there any user interaction that has surprised your testing? I think in relation to your prototyping process for um, the project that you were sharing. Yes. Um... And actually, this is another reason why I kind of put that project on hold is because as I um, as that project, um, the Uchake uh, shape shape app, um, as I begin to kind of share it and present it, you know, fresh out of uh, graduate school, um, I would get emails from international professors asking if they could use that. Um, use that application for their students. And um, so they're asking me how they could buy it and all these things. I'm explaining that gets, I don't, I, I want to give the opportunity to have a Native American decode it, which um, was one of the reasons why, you know, it was out on Apple to be, to be bought. But then also um, I asked them what their intentions were. Like, I, like, do you, do you have a, do you have an American student over there in, you know, across seas? And uh, I, so I've gotten multiple um, and I, one day I just said, you know, here, here's, um, here's uh, a, sam a sample assignment of, um, of how I have, uh, let's say, have my students, you know, assemble these shapes. So Gabe kind of like wrote up a little, I don't know, tutorial, sent it to them. And on my reply back, um, I got even more stereotypical stuff in means of, um, oh, this is how, if I were Lakota, like this would be my design. Um, and, and I get it. Like, it's like, I get, you know, people are having fun. Um, but I relate it to like um, folks who get Chinese uh, wording tattooed on them and they don't know um, exactly if, if they can't interpret it how are they gonna, like, how is it meaningful to them? Um, in my thesis, I have uh, the, the Polynesian tattoos, tattoos, another big design um, topic that needs to be talked about, but, you know, folks will get on to, they'll, they'll download an app, um, and of course, you know, with like Dwayne The Rock Johnson and more Pacific Islander, you know, per, um, visibility, in um, today, you know, people want those those like um, Islander tattoos, but there's a whole culture reference to them, and um, so it just it you know it, it yeah. gets a little bit tricky. It exactly. makes you wonder. It, like it can keep yeah. going, I'm sure. Um, I think <laughs> one other last question, and then we'll wrap up, is um, from Jez. What do you think platforms like Behance could do better around what they highlight? That is a good question. And I, I, guess I would I would question back like it like should we even be using Behance? Like I don't know. <laughs> that would be my question to the question is like is it should we use Behance or do we create our own platforms? I don't know. <laughs> you know what? It's funny. Yesterday, um, out of the blue, I had a really good friend, and I'm very proud of him, and he's been doing a lot in um, bringing the, the Dakota. Uh, culture into schools like with immersion schools and making sure that his his um his daughters have um you know know the language and know the culture and he reached out to me and he said hey I have um he said do you have a resource bank and I said like what do you what do you mean or you know I kind of just didn't couldn't picture and he said well he's like I um acquired some traditional designs from elders and I'm, you know I would like to um you know share it with you or be a witch document and you know what like that is one thing that's always kind of been in the back of my mind is, you know, I want to be in a position to start making either archive or bank or, you know, some type of gathering where it's research purpose. It's not mm -hmm. so much art purpose. It's not so much um, uh, 
you know, just the just the the the, the beautiful liveness of of cultures, but something that if you are in a position of fighting extinction and you need to revitalize either a language or or um, visual language, here are trusted resources. Um, I haven't seen one yet. I'm speaking it out loud, so I've got to build one yet. But- yep. You got to do it. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, I think if you speak it into, you know, into the, uh, the world, it is something that you have to kind of work towards. And I, I feel like it, it will happen. And I think that's what we definitely need. And it's mm-hmm. based on research, based on authenticity, and it can actually serve, um, you know, in a capacity that's, that's real. So I, I really appreciate you being here, Sadie, and sharing your work and your thoughts. And um, thank you so much for for, um, really kind of showing the arc of your your research and what you've been looking at. And I also, just as we kind of close, um, just want to to thank um, the organizing team, uh, Richard Tay, Shinjin, Sam Travis, um, the graphic design from Richard Tay, the program coordinator, Sam Morrison, um, and support from the DT program, John Sharp and Melanie Crean. And I, again, thank everyone from DT who's invited me in from communication design um, to, to be a part of the um, discussion today. So uh, thank you all for everyone who's been in attendance um, and listening in. Absolutely. Again, echoing 